died. Well, yesterday an inquiry referred to the transfusions as the worst treatment disaster in the history of the NHS and renewed calls for compensation for victims and their families. Many simply want an apology. We're joined now by Gareth Lewis, who discovered he had HIV following treatment with contaminated blood in 1984, and Carol Grayson, whose husband Peter died after years battling AIDS, also following treatment on the NHS. And we welcome you, Carol and Gareth. Thank you. Now, the thing that Gareth and Peter, your husband, have in common mm -hmm. is that you are, were, haemophiliacs, yeah. which is the inability, as far as I can understand, for the blood to to clot itself. Yeah, yeah. So if you cut yourself, the bleeding will continue and you have to have uh, transfusions yeah. very often. So, and it ran in your family, yes, you, your brother, your uncle. Yeah. So as a young boy, you were born in the late 50s, uh, and up to your 20s, you were receiving two or three transfusions a week. Yeah. And the blood, you didn't know necessarily where it came from, these transfusions, but as time went on, the, the story unfolded. And it was the same for Peter. He received yes, transfusions yes. as a young boy. And it's difficult now to look back on those days, pre-HIV, pre-AIDS, but when the knowledge of HIV and AIDS came to public awareness, people mm -hmm. who were infected with it were considered social outcasts. Mm -hmm. And it, that can't be stressed strongly enough. Nowadays we understand, but in those days we thought the plague had arrived. Mm -hmm. You have this, you are going to die. Yeah. And Gareth, you were uh, in your 20s, weren't you? Yeah. Your brother as well, as we said, hemophiliac. And he rang you one day and said, something terrible's happened. I am HIV positive. Yeah. Well, it wasn't HIV then. It was known as LAV. Which stood for what? Yeah. Uh, it was the same as HIV. Right. Yeah. And he said, I've got this, you better go and get tested. Yeah. The next day you went to the hospital, and yeah. what happened? I was walking uh, down the corridor to go to the haemophilia unit, and I bumped in to the late Professor Bloom, who was my haemophilia consultant. And he asked me why I was up there, and I said I'd come up for this test. And he said, oh, there's no need for you to be tested. We already know your status. And he asked me if there was any questions, and I said, well, you know, what's the prognosis? And he said, well, the longest people are living are two to three years. And for the next seven or eight hours, it's just a blank until about well, six o'clock that evening. So how long had it been on your notes without you knowing that you were HIV positive? OK, this was July 84. And subsequently, when we started legal litigation, I discovered that the hospital knew in 82. So they'd known for two years. But My status, but hadn't informed me. You. you were married at the time. Yes. So you had to go straight to your wife and tell her. Yes. And what, how did that affect your relationship? <laughs> um, it had a major effect. Um, the relationship broke down within six months because of the stigma. I made a decision in those days to go public with my status. And in hindsight, it was a bit of a silly thing to do. Because what happened? My house was daubed with AIDS scum, my car was vandalised, and I was attacked. Um, you know, it was horrendous. We so, were discussing this this yeah. morning, we were saying that, and the younger members of the team have no idea what it was like yeah. back mm -hmm. in, the, in the 80s, in those, uh, those early days. Um, we were talking about that, that first time that Princess Diana shook the hand yeah. of an AIDS victim and, and people were, I mean it seems so extraordinary even to say now, people were outraged, my god she's not wearing gloves and that's how ignorant everybody was at the time yeah. and your family then, through, through no fault of, uh, of your own, are wrapped up in this, in this ludicrous ignorance that, uh, that exactly. surrounded yeah. the time. Now what about your brother? My brother um, deals with the same as me, we're both very positive and we both put our anger into campaigning yes. and we um, set up a, a support group for haemophiliacs in 1986 mm. and that has continued to function till this day. And when did, you, when did you find out where that blood that you had been treated with had come from? That was sort of late, um, well early 90s you know, where the scandal of the Arkansas prison source blood came from. But Carol is the expert on the plasma uh, treatment mm. and where they came from in Arkansas prisons. Because Carol, Peter uh, was diagnosed in 80... In 85. 85. Yeah. And y you hadn't met him at that stage. No, I hadn't. Uh, mm. And so what was life like for him once he'd been diagnosed? Well, he recalls one incident where he was actually rescued from his home 
by the GP and the police because a crowd had gathered outside and they'd written slogans and they were basically wanting him out. And even at that time, I mean, I remember an MP calling for all infected people to be put on an island and that was from a member of parliament. Yes, I, I was working in news at the time, my background is, is news. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember very clearly opening a news magazine program saying that a, a child in a primary school had HIV and was probably only about five years old. Mm -hmm. Well, everybody found that school, they found that child, mm -hmm. and the, the terror that the family received, it, we keep saying this, you, we cannot stress it strongly enough to, to those who yeah, missed it all, absolutely. born in the late 80s, don't yeah. understand. So when you met him in 1991, mm -hmm. he was surviving. Were there other members of his family who, who were haemophiliac as well? He had a brother who was one of the first in the country to die of AIDS in 1986. So when I met Pete, he was very depressed. Um, he wasn't so ill physically, but it was largely due to the prejudice and stigma. Mm. Yes, and that but was it was discussed. You discussed it as a couple straight, straight away. Absolutely, yeah. And we, and we took the step to go public to try and change things. And then when we realised that things had been hidden, you know, allegedly, uh, and there was alleged negligence from the Department of Health, yeah. we decided to do our own research. And um, I mean, I basically wrote a dissertation. I wrote my own report to challenge the Department of Health. Well, but you your have a medical background, don't you? Mm -hmm. Your yeah. report yeah. Was, was used uh, in, the, in, the, in the findings that, uh, that had just been published, wasn't it? It was, because what had happened, the government said that um, a junior civil servant had inadvertently destroyed thousands of documents, and these were key documents that would have shown, we believe, alleged failings at that time. Mm. So I managed to find out where there were copies of those documents, and I went to university after my husband died, and did a master's dissertation using